सी आई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास सेवेंथ इन टाइटल्ड आर पास टू दिस इज चैप्टर टेन टाइटल एटींथ सेंचुरी पोलिटिकल फॉर्मेशन फ्रॉम पेज नंबर वन थर्टी एट टू पेज नंबर वन फिफ्टी फोर Let's listen to the chapter 10 18th century political formations page 138 If you look at maps 1 and 2 closely you will see something significant happening in the subcontinent during the first half of the 18th century Notice how the boundaries of the Mughal empire were reshaped by the emergence of a number of independent kingdoms on this page a map is shown this is map 1 it shows the state formations in the 18th century the dotted line shows the external boundaries of the mughal empire in the year 1700 in this map the main places shown in this map are लाहौर पानीपत दिल्ली, जोधपुर भरतपुर आगरा लखनऊ बड़ोदा भोपाल पूना हैदराबाद मुर्शीदाबाद पेज नंबर 139। थर्टी नाइन बाय सेवनटीन सिक्सटी फाइव नोटिस हाउ अनदर पावर द ब्रिटिश had successfully grabbed major chunks of territory in eastern india what these maps tell us is that political conditions in 18th century india changed quite dramatically and within a relatively short span of time in this chapter we will read about the emergence of new political groups in the subcontinent during the first half of the 18th century roughly from 1707 when aurangzeb died till the third battle of panipat in 1761 on the right hand top of this page a map of the subcontinent is shown this is map number 2 it shows the british territories in the mid 18th century the crisis of the empire and the later moguls In chapter 4 you saw how the Mughal empire reached the height of its success and started facing a variety of crises towards the closing years of the 17th century These were caused by a number of factors Emperor Aurangzeb had depleted the military and financial resources of his empire by fighting a long war in the Deccan Under his successors the efficiency of the imperial administration broke down it became increasingly difficult for the later mughal emperors to keep a check on their powerful mansabdars nobles appointed as governors or subedars often controlled the offices of revenue and military administration that is diwani and fauzdari as well on the right hand bottom of this page a question is being asked written in a blue box see chapter 4 table 1 which group of people challenged mughal authority for the longest time in aurangzeb's reign page number 140 this gave them extraordinary political economic and military powers over vast regions of the mughal empire as the governors consolidated their control over the provinces the periodic remission of revenue to the capital declined peasant and zamindari rebellions in many parts of northern and western india added to these problems these revolts were sometimes caused by the pressures of mounting taxes at other times there were attempts by powerful chieftains to consolidate their own positions mughal authority had been challenged by rebellious groups in the past as well but 
these groups were now able to seize the economic resources of the region to consolidate their positions. The Mughal emperors after Aurangzeb were unable to arrest the gradual shifting of political and economic authority into the hands of provincial governors, local chieftains and other groups. Rich Harvest and Empty Coffers the following is a contemporary writer's account of the financial bankruptcy of the empire. The great lords are helpless and impoverished. Their peasants raise two crops a year, but their lords see nothing of either, and their agents on the spot are virtual prisoners in the peasants' hands. Like a peasant kept his creditor's house until he can pay his debt. So complete is the collapse of all order and administration that though the peasant reaps a harvest of gold, his lord does not see so much as a wisp of straw. How then can the lord keep the armed force he should? How can he pay the soldiers who should go before him when he goes out, or the horsemen who should ride behind him? Page number 1 in the midst of this economic and political crisis, the ruler of Iran, Nadir Shah, sacked and plundered the city of Delhi in 1739 and took away immense amounts of wealth. This invasion was followed by a series of plundering raids by the Afghan ruler, Ahmad Shah Abdali who invaded North India five times between 1748 and 1761. Nadir Shah Attacks Delhi The devastation of Delhi after Nadir Shah's invasion was described by contemporary observers. One described the wealth looted from the Mughal treasury as follows. Sixty lakh of rupees and some thousand gold coins nearly one crore worth of goldware, nearly fifty crores worth of jewels, most of them unrivaled in the world, and the above included the peacock throne. Another account described the invasion's impact upon Delhi. Those who had been masters were now in dire straits, and those who had been revered couldn't even get water to quench their thirst. The recluses were pulled out of their corners. The wealthy were turned into beggars. Those who once set the style in clothes now went naked, and those who owned property were now homeless. The new city, Shah Jahanabad, was turned into rubble. Nadir Shah then attacked the old quarters of the city and destroyed a whole world that existed there. On the right-hand side of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 1. It's a 1779 portrait of Nadir Shah. Already under severe pressure from all sides, the empire was further weakened by competition amongst different groups of nobles. They were divided into two major groups or factions, the Iranis and Turanis, nobles of Turkish descent. For a long time, the later Mughal emperors were puppets in the hands of either one or the other of these two powerful groups. Page number 142 The worst possible humiliation came when two Mughal emperors, Farooq Siyar, 1713-1719, and Alamgir II, 1754 to 1759 were assassinated and two others Ahmad Shah 1748 to 1754 and Shah Alam II 1759 to 1816 were blinded by their nobles emergence of new states with the decline in the authority of the Mughal emperors the governors of large provinces subedars and the great zamindars consolidated their authority in different parts of the subcontinent. Through the 18th century, 
the Mughal Empire gradually fragmented into a number of independent regional states, broadly speaking, the states of the 18th century can be divided into three overlapping groups. One, states that were old Mughal provinces like Awadh, Bengal and Hyderabad. Although extremely powerful and quite independent, the rulers of these states did not break their formal ties with the Mughal emperor. 2. States that had enjoyed considerable independence under the Mughals as Watan Jagirs. These included several Rajput principalities. 3. The last group included states under the control of Marathas, Sikhs and others like the Jats. These were of differing sizes and had seized their independence from the Mughals after a long-drawn armed struggle. On the top left of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 2. It shows Parukh Siyar receiving a noble in the court. The Old Mughal Provinces Amongst the states, that were carved out of the old Mughal provinces in the 18th century, three stand out very prominently. These were Awadh, Bengal and Hyderabad. All three states were founded by members of high Mughal nobility who had been governors of large provinces. Sadat Khan, Awadh, Murshid Kuli Khan, Bengal and Asaf Jaha, Hyderabad. All three had occupied high Mansabdari positions and enjoyed the trust and confidence of the emperors. Both Asaf Jaha and Murshid Kuli Khan held a Zat rank of 7,000 each, while Sadat Khan's Zat was 6,000. Hyderabad Nizamul Mulk Asaf Jaha, the founder of Hyderabad state, 1724 to 1748, was one of the most powerful members at the court of the Mughal emperor, Parukh Siyar. He was entrusted first with the governorship of Awadh and later given charge of the Deccan. As the Mughal governor of Deccan provinces during 1720 to 1722, Asaf Jaha had already gained control over its political and financial administration. Taking subsequent advantage of the turmoil in the Deccan and the competition amongst the court nobility, he gathered power in his hands and became the actual ruler of that region. Asaf Jaha brought skilled soldiers and administrators from northern India who welcomed the new opportunities in the south. He appointed mansabdars and granted jagirs. Although he was still a servant of the Mughal emperor, he ruled quite independently without seeking any direction from Delhi or facing any interference. The Mughal emperor merely confirmed the decisions already taken by the Nizamul Mulk Asaf Jaha. The state of Hyderabad was constantly engaged in a struggle against the Marathas to the west and with independent Telugu warrior chiefs, Nayaks of the Plateau. The ambitions of the Nizamul Mulk Asaf Jaha to control the rich textile production areas of the Koromandal coast in the east were checked by the British who were becoming increasingly powerful in that region. See Map 2 the Nizam's Army A description of the Nizam of Hyderabad's personal troopers in 1790. The Nizam has a savari of 400 elephants. Several thousand of horsemen near his person who receive upwards 100 rupees nominal pay and are extremely well mounted and richly caparisoned. Page number 144. Awadh Burhanul Mulk Saadat Khan was appointed Subedar of Awadh in 1722 and founded a state which was one of the most important to emerge out of the breakup of the Mughal Empire. 
Awadh was a prosperous region, controlling the rich alluvial Ganga plain and the main trade route between North India and Bengal. Burhan ul Mulk also held the combined offices of Subedari, Diwani, and Fajdari. In other words, he was responsible for managing the political, financial, and military affairs of the province of Awadh. On the left hand top of this page, a question is being written in a blue box. In trying to consolidate their rule, why did Mughal Subedars also want to control the office of Divan? Burhanul Mulk tried to decrease Mughal influence in the Awadh region by reducing the number of office holders or Jagirdars appointed by the Mughals. He also reduced the size of Jagirs and appointed his own loyal servants to vacant positions. The accounts of Jagir Dars were checked to prevent cheating and the revenues of all districts were reassessed by officials appointed by the Nawab's court. He seized a number of Rajput Zamindaris and the agriculturally fertile lands of the Afghans of Rohilkhand. The state depended on local bankers and Mahajans for loans. It sold the right to collect tax to the highest bidders. These revenue farmers or ijaradars agreed to pay the state a fixed sum of money. Local bankers guaranteed the payment of this contracted amount to the state. In turn, the revenue farmers were given considerable freedom in the assessment and collection of taxes. These developments allowed new social groups like moneylenders and bankers to influence the management of the state's revenue system, something which had not occurred in the past. Page number 145 Bengal Bengal gradually broke away from Mughal control under Murshid Kuli Khan, who was appointed as the Nayab, deputy to the governor of the province. Although never a formal subedar, Murshid Kuli Khan very quickly seized all the power that went with that office. Like the rulers of Hyderabad and Awadh, he also commanded the revenue administration of the state. In an effort to reduce Mughal influence in Bengal, he transferred all Mughal Jagir Dars to Odisha and ordered a major reassessment of the revenues of Bengal. Revenue was collected in cash with great strictness from all zamindars. As a result, many zamindars had to borrow money from bankers and money lenders. Those unable to pay were forced to sell their lands to larger zamindars. The formation of a regional state in 18th century Bengal therefore led to considerable change amongst the zamindars. The close connection between the state and bankers, noticeably in Hyderabad and Awadh as well, was evident in Bengal under the rule of Ali Wardi Khan, 1740-1756. During his reign, the banking house of Jagat Seth became extremely prosperous. On the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 4. It shows Ali Wardi Khan holding court. Page number 146 If we take a bird's eye view, we can detect three common features amongst these states. First, Though many of the larger states were established by erstwhile Mughal nobles, they were highly suspicious of some of the administrative systems that they had inherited, in particular the Jagir Dari system. Second, their method of tax collection differed. Rather than relying upon the officers of the state, all three regimes 
contracted with revenue farmers for the collection of revenue. The practice of Ijaradari, thoroughly disapproved of by the Mughals, spread all over India in the 18th century. Their impact on the countryside differed considerably. The third common feature in all these regional states was their emerging relationship with rich bankers and merchants. These people lent money to revenue farmers, received land as security and collected taxes from these lands through their own agents. Throughout India, the richest merchants and bankers were gaining a stake in the new political order. The Vatan Jagirs of the Rajputs Many Rajput kings, particularly those belonging to Ambar and Jodhpur, had served under the Mughals with distinction. In exchange, they were permitted to enjoy considerable autonomy in their Vatan Jagirs. In the 18th century, these rulers now attempted to extend their control over adjacent regions. Ajit Singh, the ruler of Jodhpur, was also involved in the factional politics at the Mughal court. These influential Rajput families claimed the subedari of the rich provinces of Gujarat and Malwa. Raja Ajit Singh of Jodhpur held the governorship of Gujarat and Savai Raja Jai Singh of Ambar was governor of Malwa. These offices were renewed by Emperor Shah Jahan in 1713. On the left-hand bottom of this page, important information is provided regarding Maharana Pratap. Many Rajput rulers had accepted the suzerainty of Mughals, but Mewar was the only Rajput state which defied Mughal authority. Rana Pratap ascended the throne at Mewar in 1572, with Udaipur and large parts of Mewar under his control. A series of envoys were sent to Rana to persuade him to accept Mughal suzerainty, but he stood his ground. Page number 147 they also tried to extend their territories by seizing portions of imperial territories neighboring their vatans. Nagar was conquered and annexed to the house of Jodhpur, while Ambar seized large portions of Bundi. Savai Raja Jai Singh founded his new capital at Jaipur and was given the Subedari of Agra in 1722. Maratha campaigns into Rajasthan from the 1740s put severe pressure on these principalities and checked their further expansion. On the right-hand top of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 4B. It shows Chittorgarh Fort, Rajasthan. Many Rajput chieftains built a number of forts on hilltops which became centers of power. With extensive fortifications, these majestic structures housed urban centers, palaces, temples, trading centers, water harvesting structures and other buildings. The Chittorgarh fort contained many water bodies varying from talabs or ponds to kundis or wells and baulis or step wells etc. On the right-hand middle of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 4C. It shows Jantar Mantar in Jaipur. Savai Jai Singh, the ruler of Ambar, constructed five astronomical observatories, one each in Delhi, Jaipur, Ujjain, Mathura and Varanasi. Commonly known as Jantar Mantar, these observatories had various instruments to study heavenly bodies. Raja Jai Singh of Jaipur A description of Raja Jai Singh in a Persian court of 1732. Raja Jai Singh was at the height of his power. He was the governor of Agra for 12 years and of Malwa for 5 or 6 years. He possessed a large army, artillery and great wealth. 
his sway extended from Delhi to the banks of the Narmada. Figure 5 It shows the Mehran Gad Fort, Jodhpur. Page 148 Seizing Independence The Six the organization of the sex into a political community during the 17th century, see chapter 8, helped in regional state building in the Punjab. Several battles were fought by Guru Gobind Singh against the Rajput and Mughal rulers, both before and after the institution of Khalsa in 1699. After his death in 1708, the Khalsa rose in revolt against the Mughal authority under Banda Bahadur's leadership, declared their sovereign rule by striking coins in the name of Guru Nanak and Guru Gobind Singh and established their own administration between the Satluj and the Jamuna. Banda Bahadur was captured in 1715 and executed in 1716. On the left-hand top of this page, a question is being written in a blue box. What is the Khalsa? Do you recall reading about it in Chapter 8? On the left-hand bottom of this page, a picture is shown. This is Figure 7. This is the sword of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. On the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. It shows the tenth Guru of the six, Guru Gobind Singh. Page number 149. Under a number of able leaders in the 18th century, the six organized themselves into a number of bands called Jathas and later in missiles. Their combined forces were known as the Grand Army or Dal Khalsa. The entire body used to meet at Amritsar at the time of Baisakhi and Diwali to take collective decisions known as resolutions of the Guru or Gurmatas. A system called Rakhi was introduced offering protection to cultivators on the payment of a tax of 20% of the produce. Guru Gobind Singh had inspired the Khalsa with the belief that their destiny was to rule. Raj Karega Khalsa. Their well-knit organization enabled them to put up a successful resistance to the Mughal governors first and then to Ahmad Shah Abdali who had seized the rich province of the Punjab and the Sarkar of Sarhind from the Mughals. The Khalsa declared their sovereign rule by striking their own coin again in 1765. Significantly, this coin bore the same inscription as the one on the borders issued by the Khalsa in the time of Banda Bahadur. The Sikh territories in the late 18th century extended from the Indus to the Jamuna, but they were divided under different rulers, one of them Maharaja Ranjit Singh, reunited these groups and established his capital at Lahore in 1799. The Marathas The Maratha kingdom was another powerful regional kingdom to arise out of a sustained opposition to Mughal rule. Shivaji, 1627-1680, carved out a stable kingdom with the support of powerful warrior families, Deshmukhs, Groups of highly mobile peasant pastoralists, Kunbis, provided the backbone of the Maratha army. Shivaji used these forces to challenge the Mughals in the peninsula. After Shivaji's death, effective power of the Maratha state was wielded by a family of Chitpavan Brahmans who served Shivaji's successors as Peshwa or principal minister. Pune became the capital of the Maratha kingdom. On the right-hand top of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 7a. This is a portrait of Shivaji. Towards the end of the 17th century, a powerful state started emerging in the Deccan under the leadership of Shivaji, which finally led to the establishment of the Maratha state. 
Shivaji was born to Shahji and Jijabai at Shivneri in 1630. Under the guidance of his mother and his guardian, Dada Kondadev, Shivaji embarked on a career of conquest at a young age. The occupation of Javali made him the undisputed leader of the Mawala highlands, which paved the way for further expansion. His exploits against the forces of Bijapur and the Mughals made him a legendary figure. He often resorted to guerrilla warfare against his opponents. By introducing an efficient administrative system supported by a revenue collection method based on Chauth and Sardeshmukhi, he laid the foundations of a strong Maratha state. Page number 150 under the Peshwas, the Marathas developed a very successful military organization. Their success lay in bypassing the fortified areas of the Mughals, by raiding cities and by engaging Mughal armies in areas where their supply lines and reinforcements could be easily disturbed. Between 1720 and 1761, the Maratha Empire expanded. It gradually chipped away at the authority of the Mughal Empire. Malwa and Gujarat were seized from the Mughals by the 1720s. By the 1730s, the Maratha kingdom was recognized as the overlord of the entire Deccan Peninsula. He possessed the right to levy Chauth and Sardeshmukhi in the entire region. After raiding Delhi in 1737, the frontiers of Maratha domination expanded rapidly into Rajasthan and Punjab in the north, into Bengal and Odisha in the east and into Karnataka and Tamil and Telugu countries in the south. See map 1. These were not formally included in the Maratha empire, but were made to pay tribute as a way of accepting Maratha sovereignty. Expansion brought enormous resources, but it came at a price. These military campaigns also made other rulers hostile towards the Marathas. As a result, they were not inclined to support the Marathas during the Third Battle of Panipat in 1761. Alongside endless military campaigns, the Marathas developed an effective administrative system as well. Once conquest had been completed and Maratha rule was secure, revenue demands were gradually introduced, taking local conditions into account. Agriculture was encouraged and trade revived. This allowed Maratha chiefs or sardars like Sindhya of Gwalior, Gaikwad of Baroda and Bhosli of Nagpur the resources to raise powerful armies. Maratha campaigns into Malwa in the 1720s did not challenge the growth and prosperity of the cities in the region. Ujjain expanded under Sindhya's patronage and Indore under Holkar's. By all accounts, these cities were large and prosperous and functioned as important commercial and cultural centres. On the left-hand top of this page, an important information is shared Regarding Bajirao I. Bajirao I, also known as Bajirao Ballal, was the son of Peshwa Balaji Vishwanath. He was a great Maratha general who is credited to have expanded the Maratha kingdom beyond the Vindhyas and is known for his military campaigns against Malwa, Bundelkhand, Gujarat, and the Portuguese. On the left hand bottom of this page, Chauth and Sardeshmukhi have been explained. Chauth 25% of land revenue claimed by Zamindars. In the Deccan, this was collected by the Marathas. Sardeshmukhi 9-10% of the land revenue paid to the head revenue collector in the Deccan. Page number 151 New trade routes emerged within the areas controlled by the Marathas. The silk produced in the Chanderi region now found a new outlet in Pune, the Maratha capital. 
Burhanpur, which had earlier participated in the trade between Agra and Surat, now expanded its hinterland to include Pune and Nagpur in the south and Lucknow and Allahabad in the east. The Jats Like the other states, the Jats consolidated their power during the late 17th and 18th centuries. Under their leader Chudaman, they acquired control over territories situated to the west of the city of Delhi, and by the 1680s, they had begun dominating the region between the two imperial cities of Delhi and Agra. For a while, they became the virtual custodians of the city of Agra. The Jats were prosperous agriculturists, and towns like Panipat and Ballabgad became important trading centers in the areas dominated by them. Under Surajmal, the kingdom of Bharatpur emerged as a strong state. When Nadir Shah sacked Delhi in 1739, many of the city's notables took refuge there. His son Jawahir Shah had 30,000 troops of his own and hired another 20,000 Maratha and 15,000 Sikh troops to fight the Mughals. A picture is shown on the bottom of this page. This is figure 8. It shows the 18th century palace complex at Deeg. Note the Bangla Dome on the assembly hall on the roof of the building. On the right-hand side of this page, some very important information regarding the Jats and their leader Surajmal has been provided. The power of the Jats reached its zenith under Surajmal, who consolidated the Jat state at Bharatpur in present-day Rajasthan during 1756-1763. The areas under the political control of Surajmal broadly included parts of modern eastern Rajasthan, southern Haryana, western Uttar Pradesh and Delhi. Surajmal built a number of forts and palaces and the famous Lohagad Fort in Bharatpur is regarded as one of the strongest forts built in this region. Page number 152 while the Bharatpur fort was built in a fairly traditional style, at Deeg, the Jats built an elaborate garden palace, combining styles seen at Ambar and Agra. Its buildings were modelled on architectural forms first associated with royalty under Shah Jahan. See figure 12 in chapter 5 and figure 12 in chapter 9. The French Revolution 1789 to 1794. In the various state systems of 18th century India, the common people did not enjoy the right to participate in the affairs of their governments. In the Western world, this was the situation until the late 18th century. The American 1776 to 1781 and French revolutions changed the social and political privileges enjoyed by the aristocrats. During the French Revolution, the middle classes, peasants and artisans fought against the special rights enjoyed by the clergy and the nobility. They believed that no group in society should have privileges based on birth. Rather, people's social position must depend on merit. The philosophers of the French Revolution suggested that there be equal laws and opportunities for all. They also held that the authority of the government should come from the people who must possess the right to participate in its affairs. Movements such as the French and the American revolutions gradually transformed subjects into citizens. The ideas of citizenship Nation-state and democratic rights took root in India from the late 19th century. Imagine, you are a ruler of an 18th century kingdom. Tell us about the steps you would take to make your position strong in your province and what opposition or problems you might face 
while doing so. Page number 153. Let's recall. 1. Match the following. Subedar, Fajdar, Ijaradar, Missal, Chauth, Kunbis, Umara, a revenue farmer, a high noble, provincial governor, Maratha peasant warriors, a Mughal military commander, a band of Sikh warriors, tax levied by the Marathas. 2. Fill in the blanks. A. Aurangzeb fought a protracted war in the fill in the blank. B. Umara and Jagirdars constituted powerful sections of the Mughal fill in the blank. C. Asaf Jah founded the Hyderabad state in fill in the blank. D. The founder of the Avadh state was fill in the blank. 3. State whether true or false. A. Nadir Shah invaded Bengal. B. Savai Raja Jai Singh was the ruler of Indore. C. Guru Gobind Singh was the tenth guru of the six. D. Pune became the capital of the Marathas in the 18th century. 4. What were the offices held by Saadat Khan? Keywords Subedari Dal Khalsa Missal Fajdari Ijaradari Chauth Sardesh Mukhi Page 154 Let's discuss 5. Why did the Nawabs of Awadh and Bengal try to do away with the Jagir Dari system? 6. How were the Sikhs organized in the 18th century? 7. Why did the Marathas want to expand beyond the Deccan? 8. What were the policies adopted by Asaf Jaha to strengthen his position? 9. Do you think merchants and bankers today have the kind of influence they had in the 18th century? 10. Did any of the kingdoms mentioned in this chapter develop in your state? If so, in what ways do you think life in the state would have been different in the 18th century from what it is in the 21st century? Let's do. 11. Find out more about the architecture and culture associated with the new courts of any of the following, Awadh, Bengal or Hyderabad. 12. Collect popular tales about rulers from any one of the following groups of people, the Rajputs, Jats, Sikhs or Marathas. The chapter 10 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator Babla Kochar. You were just listening to this audio book. Technical control, Bati Langlingdo. Technical assistance, Vikas Sangwan. Assistance in production, Kusum Lata. Direction and production, Vimalesh Chaudhary. This audio book is brought to you by CIET and CERT, New Delhi, India.